basically, as soon as I hear that people are passionate about politics, that's when I start to get afraid. Like, like this has become like a religion. People are very upset. They're emotional. And upset, emotional people make bad decisions, generally. Like, you wouldn't want to see your brain surgeon be like, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> or like, oh, this is going to be the greatest test of my ability as a surgeon. Like, I don't want to hear that. No, I don't want someone coming in, giving a speech. I want him to be calm, focused, do his job. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jess Vergali and you're listening to Working Capital. My guest today is Brian Kaplan. Brian is an American economist and author. He is a professor of economics at George Mason University, research fellow at the Mercatus Center, adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and former contributor to Freakonomics blog and Econlog. He currently publishes his own blog, Bet On It. Brian, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. So for those that don't know, uh, Brian, uh, your work, I got interested in your work quite some time ago. I think, I don't know, 07, 08, when you wrote The Myth of the uh, Rational Voter. Um, so there's a few titles here, and I'll say, we'll put these in the show notes, um, but there's a couple of the titles where I think, uh, you know, the way you title your books, I think, had that provocative uh, feel for me when I was, you know, when I'm browsing. So uh, The Case Against Education, Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids. And then I believe The Open Borders was just Open Borders, The Science and Ethics of Immigration which was super cool because I've gifted that multiple times because it's cool. uh, in the form of a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. So for those that uh, kind of don't know your work, maybe you could just have a brief kind of overview of, you know, what you do as an economist, how you got into the field uh, and, you know, what the goals are with, with these type of books. I'd say I write books where I think that if I don't write them, no one will. I try to find orphan topics, topics that I think are very worthy and there's a lot to be said in their favor intellectually and yet it hasn't been done. How would one find such topics? Honestly, the main thing I do is I find truths that are ugly, things that people just get scared of even though the evidence is really strong. And yeah, when you apply that rule, then it is easy to come up with very solid arguments that haven't been explored much because people don't want to touch them despite their merits. So that's basically how I choose all of my books. I do have plenty of normal views. I think the sky is blue like everybody else, but I'm never going to write a book on the sky is blue, you know, arguments about the sky or something like that. And like, as to how I got into this, you know, I'm a professor. Being a professor is extremely hierarchical. There's an exact process whereby you become a professor. And I did all the steps. The steps end with you get tenure, and then finally, instead of being hyper constricted, you can really do anything you want for the rest of your life. So I have been in that stage for about 20 years now. Uh, until then, I just towed the line, did what I needed to do. But since then, I've been living the dream. So I listened uh, to you on a podcast, I think it was uh, a few weeks ago, and I believe it was a discussion about psych psychology professors and economics professors. And you said mm -hmm. economics professors essentially fill in the void of basically telling people what they already know. Um, I think you said uh, the ugly truths. Could you, you have anything to say on that? Hmm. Sure. That's one of the things economists do. And I think it's where we actually have something interesting to say. So sometimes economists want to hear, well, what do you think is going to happen to interest rates? But all right, whatever. But if it's things like, how do we get bread in the stores? Then the classic economist answer is self-interest. Adam Smith said, not from benevolence as the baker baker's bread for his own regard to his own self-interest. On one hand, it's kind of ugly to realize that greed is driving so much of what happens in society. But on the other hand, it's pretty hard to disagree with it once you hear it. You can desperately try to say, oh, no, no, that's not what's really going on. Like, what else could be going on other than people are baking bread in order to make money than people doing it for fun? I mean, there's maybe a little fun in it, but... You wouldn't just expect that someone will show up at your door with bread and say, here you go. I really like making bread for people. So that's how that goes. Uh, just to, you know, like, there's lots of other examples. Let's see, here's one, uh, which is highly relevant during COVID. Uh, you hear that a newly approved drug will save 10,000 lives per year. And people go, yay, isn't that great? It's like, well, how many years did you delay the drug for? Um, just seven. All right, so like, what's seven times 10,000? Uh, 70,000, where are you going with this? Like, well, 
Isn't that number of people you killed by delaying it for seven years? Um, no. It's like, yes. But there's like, how can you even get around that argument? During COVID, it was uh, quite clear what was going on. They cut, they cut out a lot of steps in the, in the regulatory process. Conspiracy theorists will say, ah, oh, this is just terrible. There were economists like, well, yeah, well, like we needed to cut out the steps because we needed to get the drug soon. If we went through all the steps, we would like the, we've already reached herd immunity before the vaccine comes along. So we didn't want to wait and we saved a lot of lives. So good for us. And then it's like, well, yeah, but then what's the normal approval process? So like, why do we have that? Why is it normally streamlined? Or why isn't there at least an option to go and take a drug before it's officially approved? Why do we have this crazy system? And, and of course, once you start going down that route, there's all sorts of other ugly questions to ask, like, why did the FDA sit on the evidence for a few weeks while they went through the normal process? And he was like, well, they needed time to read the report. Like, how many people in that committee do you think actually read reports? Yeah. Really read the reports? I mean, like, honestly, it mostly just consists in taking the pharmaceutical companies at their word. Pharmaceutical companies have some sense of, well, if we totally lie, then we're going to get sued into the ground, so we better not. But they, they go through this farce of like, oh, we're going to go and read all the words. It takes three weeks, three more weeks of people dying while we wait. Well, I mean, what are you talking about? No, 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 no. It's three weeks of helping people. Hmm. So three weeks of a trade-off, which seems to be unnecessary. What's wrong with you? Uh, so there's, you know, economics really is full of examples like this. Um, you well, like- I can do this all day if you want. Yeah. Oh, I like the, you know, the first most basic one is, uh, I think you said we have scarce resources and we can't have everything, you know, econ 101, which, yeah. you know, depending on who you're voting yeah. for or who's running for office, uh, you know, they're not, <laughs> it's not a platform to win on. Yeah. Resources are scarce, wants are unlimited. You never get that. Nobody ever gets the best of anything, actually, despite politicians promise to give every American or every Canadian the best, whatever. And it's like, look, by definition, at most, one person gets the best. We can't all have the best, right? And usually not, even, usually not even that, because normally if we put a lot more research into something, we could have done it, but we don't because we've got a bunch of different wants and we settle for second best or 10th best or 110th best almost all the time. So we just had uh, Mariel elections in uh, Toronto. Um, it was fairly, uh, there's a, a long list of, of people to choose from. Uh, now in our world on the business and uh, real estate side, with fairly strong opinions uh, uh, on real estate, on policy, and then on the housing side, very strong opinions on that side. Now, I am not saying, you know, I'm biased towards landlords. I, you know, I'll, I'll throw that out there. However, uh, I do think that there's a middle ground between Florida and Toronto in terms of housing policy and, and uh, rent stabilization. All mm -hmm. that to say is there's a lot of people passionate about voting in this particular election. Does it matter? And it, maybe you could couch that into, you wrote the rational, um, uh, sorry, the myth, myth of the, the, the myth, yeah, the myth of the rational uh, voter. If you could talk a little bit about what that means and what the upshot of that book was. Sure. And more recently, Voters as Mad Scientists, which is a collection of essays with the same theme. Basically, as soon as I hear that people are passionate about politics, that's when I start to get afraid. Like, like this has become like a religion. People are very upset. They're emotional. And upset, emotional people make bad decisions, generally. Like, you wouldn't want to see your brain surgeon be like, oh, my God, oh, my God. <laughs> or like, oh, this is going to be the greatest test of my ability as a surgeon. Like, I don't want to hear, no, I don't want someone coming in, giving a speech. I want him to be calm, focused, do his job. Yeah, so um, obviously in the case of housing, there is enormous resentment of landlords, enormous resentment of developers. And if you just sit back and say, well, are these not the people that provide the valuable product? Without them, the product would not exist seems obvious enough, and yet that barely changes people's minds about the situation. Um, instead, there's normally a great desire to go and scapegoat them and blame them for what's wrong with the world. Like, and even if you do go and say developers cause how high, high housing prices, well, what do you think developers wanna do? They want to develop stuff. They wanna develop a lot of stuff. They develop a lot of stuff that makes it abundant, which makes it cheap. So it just doesn't make much sense to be blaming them for high prices unless that, well, they are being highly curtailed in their ability to do their job, which uh, is in fact what we see in almost every desirable location in the world these days, is governments look at anyone that builds real estate as if they are, if not actual criminals, then at least suspicious 
they're sus. Like, what does he want to do? You want to take a bunch of old small buildings, replace them with big buildings and make money. And what's your real goal? What's your, what are you really thinking? Well, ah, okay, you're greedy. It's like, well, but in the process, I produce a product that people like. Uh, as to why it is that the businesses that make housing live under so much more suspicion than the businesses that make food, I don't know. They're both obviously vital necessities. And uh, probably people can figure out that if you strangle the wheat supply, wheat's going to be expensive. But uh, there you have it. So on that topic of um, housing in general, like I said, between, you know, especially in the States where you have people and in, their investing thesis can be oftentimes based on red or blue states, uh, depending on the housing policy of those states. Uh, we're a little bit more homogenous here across the board in Canada. So, you know, for us, it would be actually cross-border investing. But um, to play devil's advocate on the other side, this idea that uh, we need affordable housing, uh, we don't have a enough affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, we have these rent replacement uh, strategies that cities have where you build in a big apartment, you must replace rent, you must replace it at the current uh, current rental rate or, or have a portion of your building basically be uh, affordable housing. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think those policies are, are unfounded in, in terms of the data or would you, or do you, you know, what's your view on those? Yeah. So basically it just amounts to putting a tax on the people that produce housing and then saying, I don't understand why there's more cheap housing. And it would be like saying that if you go and grow food, you have to go and give some affordable food to 20% of the population. Mm. It's like, well, what's that going to do? Well, um, if you're lucky, then yes, you get this cheaper food for 20% of the population and everybody else pays more. But then there's the question of why is it that we're so determined to go and redistribute food with taxes on food, the standard economics says you're going to redistribute. The best way of funding it is with the broadest base possible tax. I mean, it would be like saying, well, okay, so we're going to go and redistribute boats with boats and clothes with clothes. And for each time we'll have a special tax on each of these. It's just a chaotic, confused system. And especially when the, the more you want something to be affordable, the bigger the tax is, which is pretty much a perverse approach to doing it. Again, I'd say that you know, like if, if people would just step back and realize how intense the regulation already is, the solution for affordable housing is really obvious. It's deregulate and then housing will be affordable the end. Um, the reality, I think, is people just don't like it that way. They don't like the idea of just leaving developers alone and accepting their own culpability for having caused the problem in the first place. And so they do want to go and scapegoat them and say, look, if you, like, you were the one that caused this problem, how? By, by producing it. And we're gonna go and put a special tax on you in order to reverse the harm you've done. And I was like, what harm did I do? Just not producing extra stuff for people that weren't gonna pay me, which is pretty much what every business, every worker does. I mean, if you were to think about, you know, the affordable Jesse services, 20% of your time were earmarked for affordable Jesse. <laughs> well, that basically means that there is a tax on all of your work and that all of your other customers are going to be paying more. Right? And of course, there is a severe danger. Maybe you'll say, hey, in that case, maybe I don't even want to be around and be doing this kind of stuff. I'm going to have to go and deal with these problems. Pro bono, Jesse, is, is off the table now. Um, mm -hmm. On that point, though, for us, you know, I'm charitable to that argument, especially when it comes to zoning, where we lift up certain zoning, we actually in virtue of that, get more affordable housing because you allow more housing. What do you think the, you know, you, you made the comparison between our industry and say the food industry. Mm -hmm. What do you think the, it's almost a kind of a guttural response. Why mm -hmm. do you think that is a, it, as it relates to real estate that people are so passionate mm -hmm. about this? Because I think the counter argument would people, people would say, you know, you're going to have developers come and raise rent. So it won't be affordable. But I think what you're saying in, in essence is that you're actually increasing the supply. So yeah. eventually you actually will see a depression on, on pricing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the, the other thing to keep in mind is that normally well, the new housing you build is nice housing because you want, when it's originally built, it's nice. It takes time for housing to become worse. So the normal pattern is poor people live in older housing, rich people live in newer housing, but nevertheless, there's still a close connection between all these markets. When you go and build nice new housing, some people are moving out of the not so nice housing into the new, into the nice housing, which then frees up that older housing for other people, all in a, in a nice connected chain. Uh, there's been a good amount of academic research on this. It's common sense and it does work. 
Um, let's see, but there was some other question uh, built in that I think you know, to, that was uh, included there that I don't think that I'm getting at. So I think for her originally it was the zoning piece. I was just making a comment that with yeah. you open up certain yeah, regulations. Yeah, right. Yeah. But like, but why is it that people specifically are so suspicious of housing? Hmm. That is an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, it's not clear that why it would be housing rather than food. You can say, well, it's housing, you sort of just come up with this enormous chunk of money at once through a loan, something like that. But then, of course, a lot of people rent. Yeah, I don't have any really good explanation for why people fixate on housing specifically. We do actually have some pretty good evidence that housing is the industry where people are at least close to maximally hostile to supply and demand stories about how it works. So like, there was one study where they gave five different different kinds of products. Like for used cars, people seem to be pretty amenable to a normal textbook story where, well, yes, if there's uh, supply disruptions for the production of new cars, which means that people can't get new cars, which means they're gonna go and increase demand for old cars, which means the price of, of, the, of the used cars goes up. That kind of story it seemed like people were pretty accepting of it and they didn't say it's just some plot to go and do something bad to regular people like me. Uh, as to why it is that people can go and apply the logic for cars, but not houses. You know, honestly, I think, I think they can apply the logic in either case. It's whether they want to apply the logic as to why there's special resentment of developers versus car dealers. I really don't have a good story about that other than to say it's just true. And it's how it's just is, is the way that it is. I mean, I could have some sort of justo story about how, well, you look at housing all the time and you don't look at their cars. And it's like, well, you can't look at their cars. So um, I'll just say uh, um, what we know is that people do feel this way. Understanding why they feel this way is not that easy to understand. You know, I don't have the answer to that either. Um, but my running thesis on developers is we view them a lot like speculators, which which is mm -hmm. not not <laughs> unreasonable. Um, but then I think there's a, there's a component of a power imbalance when it comes to a landlord tenant relationship. And, and I, this is anecdotal. Well, what, what about for a food seller eater? It's like without food, you die. <laughs> that's true. That's so true. If, yeah. you, if you were inclined to see power imbalances, you might go and see anyone selling food or like, how about water? It's like, this guy's got the water. What am I supposed to do here? Yeah. Like, yeah. If I don't pay him that I don't, then I die of thirst. And this yeah. is what I think when people, I do think say, well, I could get water in a bunch of other ways. And, yeah. You know, you so, know, but then it's like, yeah, okay, well, there's a lot of places you could live. So, and well, you know, so what's really the difference? Yeah, it's definitely uh, of, you know, the, this analogy between speculators and developers. I mean, there is one similarity where both are hoping that by the time that they that they're ready to sell, prices will be high. But there is this obvious difference of developers build stuff, and speculators, almost by definition, are just buying and holding existing stuff. So, I'd say mm -hmm. there is pretty. I mean, like if you, I mean, yeah. Nothing, not there's anything wrong with buying things and holding them, but yeah, uh, still, like, like if someone did think that was bad, I'd still be confused about what they've got against building a skyscraper. I 100% agree, and not to mention the the risk that's involved. Uh, you know, there's real estate investing, and then there's development, and I see those as two slightly different things uh, because yeah. there is a, a huge yeah. uh, risk uh, when you're you know waiting for things to be done. Um, yeah. I want to quickly move to uh, open borders. Uh, so this book, I this was fascinating to me, and I don't think what's great about this book for anybody that's interested. If you're on the conservative end of things, don't be scared by the title. And if you're, you know, if you're on the other side, don't think it's just going to be a reiteration of what you b currently believe. I, I genuinely think the book is apolitical um, in that it uses a lot of economic arguments. And what's cool about the book, I think I said it at the outset is you did it in a graphic novel style. Um, how come you chose that that route to kind of expound on some pretty complicated uh, topics? Here's the problem. There's all kinds of high quality research on important questions that is written in an extremely boring way, right? And so it basically just lives in a journal, unread, unnoticed, and having literally little influence on the world. One of the main things that I try to do as a researcher is to collect research that is intrinsically important, but it's just so either super boring as, uh, as supplied, or it's just hard to see why it's important in isolation. You need to put it beside a lot of other work. So that's what I really try to do in almost all of my books is I'm trying to assemble a lot of evidence that otherwise would be neglected and then present it in a more engaging way that actually gets people thinking about it and talking about it. I've done that in my earlier books and I think I did pretty well, but nevertheless, I was thinking about, well, can I do better? Is there some other format? 
I'm a fan of this nonfiction graphic novel format. For example, there's the Cartoon History of the Universe in five volumes, um, where on the one hand, it's very accurate. Any area of history that I know well, it has the facts right. But on the other hand, by combining words and pictures, it's more engaging. It teaches more per minute's worth of, view of reader attention. It gets more time because, uh, from the reader because it is more entertaining. So basically you just get a, a much larger increase in learning and I think probably in retention as well because I think the visuals help people to remember. Uh, so anyway, since I was a fan of the genre, I did get the idea, well, maybe I could do it. I do have the problem I can't draw, but I just started making storyboards and felt like it was coming along pretty well. I managed to get my number one choice of artist in the world, Zach Wienersmith, who does the web karmic of Saturday morning breakfast cereal. And then I was able to go and get my one and only New York Times bestseller, which is Open Borders. Uh, so it wasn't just me that liked it. Uh, if, if it was honestly super fun to write. I mean, like when I do my regular stuff, I've always got writer's block and all, like often I'll struggle, I'll just get a paragraph done in a day. But when I'm doing a graphic novel, never felt blocked, always felt like I could be, I was moving forward in some way or other. So it is, and it just uses more skills lets you use your visual thinking, lets you know words, just trying to go and, and reorganize things. So just a very fun kind of project. And that's, anyway, so that's what I did for that. It was an experiment and I think the experiment worked out really well. I was really gratified. Yeah, it's a, it's a super fun read and uh, visually it's great. Uh, when you wrote the book and probably now, I mean, when you're asked on it, I, I assume that there's uh, arguments that come up more often than other arguments. And I know throughout the mm -hmm. book, it's been a couple of years since I last read it, but it, you know, you talked about, you know, people's concern with security and then people's concern with driving down wages of, of the, mm -hmm. um, you know, the population in the States, if, if we use that as an example, but in terms of the arguments that you find you're defending the most, how do those stack up? Hmm. Well, let's see. I'd say that you just talk to people that haven't thought about it very much. Most of it comes down to, like they're going to ruin our standard of living. They're going to bring down our wages to rock bottom and also they're on welfare. Uh, when you talk to people who are more into the issue, a lot of it actually becomes less quantitative and it's, they just start talking about culture often in very vague terms and unwilling to be any less vague, but to say, look, we're not culturally compatible with them. Um, and really like my main answer to that comes down to the general principle, like actions speak louder than words. Let's go and actually see, is it really true that people are willing to pay a lot of money to avoid being around immigrants? Uh, I say it does not seem to be so. Uh, people seem to, in fact, be perfectly happy living right next to immigrants. You may say their culture is too different as well. It's not so different that you don't want to live next to them. If their culture was really crazy, you wouldn't want to live next to them if they were cavemen or something, right? Cannibals, then yeah, then you really would want to get out of their neighborhood. Uh, so you know, my view is most of this is just greatly overstated. Uh, you know, if someone were to say, look, being in an immigrant neighborhood reduces my demand by 2%, then I say, yeah, okay, I can believe you. Hmm. Uh, but is that a good reason to take drastic action to go and do anything if it bothers you by 2%? I think there's, you know, in politics, usually there's just so much hyperbole, people acting like it's the end of the world when really it's at most some marginal issue. Uh, so... Right, and also never considering, well, think about who else your neighbors could be. They could be natives who are pain in the neck. So what about them? Yeah, and I think from the book, you make kind of a, uh, not a social justice, but a justice uh, mm -hmm. argument that, uh, you know, you put all that, those concerns, and then you put them against the fact that you have somebody that's in, in dire poverty yeah. in one situation, in one area, and could be not yeah. in another situation. And I'm not sure if it was in your book or writing of, like, the actual practical implication <coughs> of having open borders or something close to that, where potentially you could sponsor somebody coming over. Was there any kind of discussion on the mechanics of how something like that would actually work for immigration in, in the States or Canada? That's, that's a great question. So I don't think I even mentioned, mentioned sponsorship in my book. Obviously it's a pretty obvious, you know, it's a pretty natural idea. Um, the person that is best known for that is, let's see, the book is Radical Markets. Yeah, Glenn, Glenn Weil and Eric Posner. So they have a proposal, which I like very much, uh, where they just say, look, every citizen of a rich country should be able to go and sponsor one immigrant, or maybe every adult. Right? Um, now, they go into a lot of details about how this would work. Honestly, I like it just because if you know anything about the supply and demand for immigration, 
the, you know, if you had that many tickets to go and admit people, then the price of the ticket would be almost zero. And it basically would be like open borders in particular, as long as you could go and sell it to someone else. So, you know, if you've got for the U S if you have like 300 million immigration tickets available, and then you, and you say you sell them to, you know, sell them to someone else and then resells them, you know, the price is probably going to be like 10 bucks because there aren't three. And you know, while there's a lot of people want to move to the U S we don't have 300 million people that want to move anytime soon. All right. So, um, I mean, really, I like the idea, but more just because it is tantamount to open borders. Uh, you know, like a, a much stricter version of this would be something like every individual is able to go and sponsor 5% of a person. And then you have to assemble 20 permits to get one person in. Then the permits would have value. But essentially, if you just make too many, oh, if we had a trillion permits, then they would be free because there's, there aren't a trillion people on earth. So then everyone could have one. For something, uh, for some reason, I think in our climate, that's that's the paper that gets published, the the five percent of somebody paper. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you have to first uh, like the idea of sponsorship before you can <laughs> go and start tweaking it this way. I think you know, like when I was mentioning this to Glenn Weil, he said, "Yeah, that's why we're going to ban reselling." Mm. I was like, "Oh, great! Now we're going to have to go and inconvenience everybody and do it the hard way." It's like, why not just be honest and say oh, immigration's good and leave it at that? So, but so. Uh, I mean, it's some kind of a political plan, but again, okay, it's it's more of just you know, something that isn't very well thought out, but uh, happens to coincidentally lead to something really good. Fair enough. Now, I want to get to the final book uh, that I think is most recent, uh, Don't Be a Feminist, which um, I haven't read, so I'm, I'm excited to hear about this one. But in terms of, before we get there, I just wanted to quickly- so There's actually two final books. There's Don't Be a Feminist and there's Voters of Mad Scientists. Voters of Mad Scientists. Yes, yes. And before we get there, uh, if you could briefly go over, and I apologize for the brevity of it, uh, the case against education. What's your beef with education, Brian? It's pretty simple. Uh, we think about education as being a place where you acquire useful skills. And yet, if you pay close attention to those, that most of your time you're learning stuff that you'll never need to actually know after the exam, stuff that is not actually useful in real life. Then there's the puzzle of why is it that labor markets care so much? Why do employers care so much about your performance in school? Uh, there is a longstanding theory that explains all this. It's called signaling. And it says that a lot of the reason why education pays is not that you're getting useful skills. It's to give you a stamp on your forehead. Uh, the way that I describe it is we like to think about education as job training, whereas it's really more of a passport to the real training, which happens on the job. From the point of view of an individual, it doesn't really matter why education pays, but from the point of view of education policy, it matters immensely. If when you go to school, you're actually increasing your productivity, this is something that benefits all of society. On the other hand, if you are just getting stamps in your forehead, education creates credential inflation. It just means that the more education people have, the more you need to not have your job application thrown in the trash. And that's what I say has been going on in almost all societies uh, since World War II anyway is we keep pumping up the amount of education in the population in this futile rat race, thinking that if everybody goes to college, then everybody can get a really good job. And the reality is that's not how it works. The reality is that we now just have a whole bunch of menial jobs where you still often either need or it is better for you to have fancy credentials, even if you're just a waiter or driving an Uber. Right? So that's the problem is essentially just wasting a whole pile of taxpayer dollars and a whole lot of student time to end up in the same place we could have gotten just by starting life at an earlier age. So that's my real quick case against education. For the economics professor, would that be the dead weight loss there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is the dead weight loss. Yeah. I mean, so you know, like it is striking. If you just go and read autobiographies from people from the thirties and forties and just see how young people are not just working, but they are already rising up the ladder and just doing amazing things with their lives. And then you're like, why doesn't that happen now? Like, well, now you have to go and do all the school. It's like, hmm. But it seems like people in the 30s and 40s were able to do quite complicated jobs without school. How do they do that? How do they do that? The answer is they learned on the job, hmm. which coincidentally is the same way almost everyone today learns how to do their jobs, actually. Even if you do something that pretends to be vocational, like law school, you really spend most of it learning the law of 12th century England. And then you show up at a 21st century law firm and they say, hey, by the way, it's not the 12th century anymore. And here's the way things actually work under current law, which they didn't teach you when you were in law school. They're teaching you totally out of date law. It would be malpractice to, just to use what you learned in law school. Uh, here's how we do it. And 
well, let's just learn by doing. That's the way it actually works in pretty much in almost every field that I know of. Learning by doing is what really matters. And the other part of it is basically the rationing mechanism to determine who gets to even get that kind of actual on the job training. I like it. We'll put a link up to that as well. Okay, Brian, uh, let's see here. This is a provocative title. Don't be a feminist essays on genuine justice, which correct me if I'm wrong. Was this a article that was a, a letter to your daughter or that was the, uh, the title? Right. So it's a book of essays, but the first essay was, uh, it was never before published something that I just been writing in my head for about 10 years, ever since I had a daughter. And I finally decided I got a good block of time. I'm going to actually write this essay. Um, and I was thinking like, where could I place it? And I said, I'm just going to go and make it the title essay of this book of, of this, of this collection of essays on what I like to call the social injustice movement or what so many people call social justice or the woke movement. Um, so I, I know in terms of what I'm saying in the essay, I mean, you know, so like, as, as, as you were saying, um, I, I write it as a letter to my daughter. She's actually too young to really be reading it yet, but I just wanted to have it out there for as soon as she is curious about it. I mean, I can definitely picture her saying, dad, what's I'm hearing about feminism. What do you think about it? And what I think about it is first that there is a popular definition which violates normal usage. There's this popular definition of feminism is just the view that men and women should be equal, which uh, Feminist Louise Perry admitted this is a definition that would appeal to all except the most reactionary Saudi sheik. And it's such an inclusive definition. Well, who disagrees with that? Yeah. I actually found public opinion data where 95% of Americans who say they are not feminists still agree that men and women should be treated equally, which I shows this is a terrible definition. It's like calling your newspaper truth and then saying, oh, you disagree with truth. You know, it's, it's, a, it's just a language game. It's not a good definition of how people actually use the word. What is a good definition? Uh, the definition that I propose is just this. Feminism is the view that our society generally treats men more fairly than women. I think it is a very nice way of capturing what is it the feminists are saying. They have complaints about the relative treat fairness of the treatment women receive. And what is it that anti-feminists are really saying? They're saying at minimum, I don't agree that they're being treated unfairly, or maybe they think the unfairness goes the other way, or at least it's like, I'm not sure enough to really weigh in on this. So I think that is the real divide between those two groups. And once you think of it that way, then the question is, all right, well, who's right? Uh, this is where being an economist makes some difference because many feminist complaints are ones that economists have been thinking about for a long time. What we have figured out has not really filtered down to feminists or to the popular conversation but on things like the salary gap between men and women. Mm. Their standard view really does seem to be that employers are just very unfair people and they don't like and they don't like women and don't respect them and don't appreciate them. And so for no reason other than this unfairness, they pay women a lot less. Uh, which really is hard to understand as a business model for the following reason. It does suggest there is a really simple way for any business to become fabulously profitable, right? And can you the figure out what is the really simple way of ever for every business to become fabulously profitable? The all woman business. Yeah, that's right. Fire all the men, replace them all with cheap women. Mm -hmm. Why not? Right? Do you really think the businesses are so uninterested in money that such a simple plan does not would not tempt them if it were actually viable? Uh, so the usual view is it's not really viable because, in fact, the main reason why men and women earn different amounts of money isn't that isn't due to differences in the fairness of treatment. It's due to differences in skills and motivation and trade-offs. Uh, there is a great book called Why Men Earn More, which just goes through 25 different reasons why men make more money than women. Uh, the book is a self-help book for women, primarily saying, hey, women, these are things, that are the, these are sacrifices that men make in order to make more money. And if you want to make more money, you could try doing a few of them. Things like major in STEM, you know, work the night shift, work weekends, you know, work in undesirable locations, work alone, right? work in the outdoors, do something dangerous. These are all differences between the kinds of jobs that men and women do. And it does explain a great deal of the difference in earnings between men and women Right? And when you put it this way, then really you are left with the really high bar of our society should re-socialize everyone so that we all want the same kinds of things. And this is where I'll say, like, 
know, it sounds to you, it sounds to me like you're the one that's being really unfair and you are just expecting the whole world to revolve around your philosophy and maybe people just have different preferences and you should get off people's cases and stop making false accusations about the unfairness of the world. So that one on the, on the salary gap or the pay gap is one that economists have worked on a lot, but there's a lot of other examples that we can talk about. So just just on that one with the uh, salary gap. So to me, the the aha moment for me years ago, and this was a, one of my economist professors was uh, showing or it talked about data on women that were um, uh, never married, right? They they never married, yes. never had kids, and and there's yes. pretty much parity, if not they yeah. in some studies they earn yes. more than men. Yes. And to me, that kind of clicked for me. But I think though, once when, when people, you know, you give the example of all women staff, and uh, on the side too, I'm also surprised there's this huge movement with Jordan Peterson and people online where, you know, I guess non-economists or people that haven't thought about this are, are finally hearing some of this information and then it, it starts getting vitriolic or political. But just on that piece there, I think there is a, there's an inherent feeling where people are like, okay, well, there still is some sort of imbalance here where women are taken out of the labor market. And I remember talking to somebody about this and said, and basically the argument that she initially had she conceded, uh, you know, with with the data with people that have never been married, never had children as women. But then there was also the argument of, well, the, how do you address the fact that we're taken out of the workforce? And it's true. If any man, man as, he, as the run up in his career in his mid 20s takes four years out of the workforce, that has to have an economic impact on on his earning potential. I mean, I start with this bizarre grammar of we are taken out of the workforce. It's a personal <laughs> decision. That of some course, of course. Don't. Yeah. And it's also one where you say, hmm, so on the one hand, it's true that there is more of a social expectation that if you're going to have kids, that women will go and take time out or switch to part-time work. On the other hand, suppose there was a man who said, hey, I would like to go and get this deal. I'd like to have a woman go and work full-time while I stay home and take care of kids or only the part-time job. Good luck with him getting that. Right? Uh, so you'd say that if there is unfairness, it goes both ways. And we just have this strong tendency to be hyper-focused on any complaint that women might have without considering, are there analogous complaints that men might have? And then, as I say in the essay, there's really two different ways that you can look at this. One is to say, man, the whole world's so unfair. Men have a lot of good complaints. Women have a lot of good complaints. The other one is to say, maybe you should take some responsibility for your life and say, look, I'm, I've got, I have these endowments. I've got these opportunities. I'm going to make the most of them, and I'm not going to go and complain about the fact that the world owes me stuff so yeah so like men have a bunch of opportunities that women don't have women have a bunch of opportunities that men don't have uh, we could either argue about who has it better which again is sort of the one well, the normal argument is really just a very one-sided these are all the ways that men have it better hmm. the response to that can be uh, actually you're missing out on half what's going on in the world there's a bunch of analogous complaints for men i do that although my hope is at the end of the day everyone will stop complaining <laughs> sort of my dream and just to realize you know for any complaint you've got there's probably another person similarly situated on the opposite side who has a similarly reasonable complaint and once we accept that everybody's got problems the world world just looks very different and, you know, and like it does help people to get responsibility for themselves i've been arguing with feminist louise perry she granted a lot of my points and she said well but women label under the status insult and the status insult that she said that women feel is that they're considered childlike. So on the other one hand, people, you see admits, like people are actually nicer to women, they care more about women and their welfare, but still there's sort of a condescending or patronizing attitude that society has towards women. And I said, okay, well, maybe there's something to what you're saying, but if we're looking around for status insults, what is it like to be a man? I said, well, if people think of women as somewhat childlike, we think about men as somewhat beast-like, and yeah, I'd actually, I would prefer to be seen as being a child- Perhaps toxic, Brian. Beast. Yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, I, I think I was telling her in this interview, once I just went to a high school where my sons were taking a test and I just sat there waiting for them to finish in order to pick them up. And I actually got a school monitor to come over to me and says, oh, sir, we've received a complaint that there was a man sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I couldn't help but laugh. And I like, yeah, guilty. And then I explained, I say, well, I'm, I'm a dad. I'm waiting. My sons are taking a test. I'm here to pick them up. <laughs> if I was just a woman of the same age sitting there, everyone would have said, obviously, that's a mom, totally harmless. Uh, for me, since I was a man, they said, oh, well, that's sort of threatening, sort of like, like, well, how are we to react to this male human sitting there? Feels like, like a Simpsons. There, there, yeah, if there, was a, if there was a tiger there, we would do something about it, wouldn't we? 
Now I could have gotten really upset about it, but I said, all right, well, like, all right, fine. Statistically, there's probably some greater tendency of a guy to be a threat. I mean, I think it's still pretty low and you guys are mm. kind of paranoid. Um, so but that, remaining, I think that does illustrate that, you know, these the status insults are all over and you can either dwell on them and feel sorry for yourselves and get angry at the world, or you can go and realize, well, look, it is a minor problem that I have. Most people have either the same problem or a similar problem. And I'm just going to make the most of my life without making a federal case out of it. Fair enough. Um, we definitely have to have a chat again to, to delve a little deeper on these. Um, the last point on this book, uh, you, you talked about a bit about kind of the, the backdrop of a bit of a woke culture uh, mm. where we're going in that direction. Uh, and especially a, Canada, right? Canada's yeah. a lot worse than us. I was going to say as an outsider looking in, uh, you know, I, we, I, I feel like the, the passion and, and, um, on both sides is seems more obvious when I'm looking at the States, but to your point, I, I think that mm. a lot of this is, uh, it's North American, I think in term or global, uh, in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, what's your working definition of woke and, you know, and, and what's the, what's the issue here as you see it? It's, it's an extreme version of a particular kind of leftism. It's not like Marxism, Leninism, where it's really focused on economics. It's very heavily focused on the idea there's a list of oppressed races, oppre oppressed sexes, oppressed gender identities, ethnicities. Um, it's you know, underlying it is the strong assumption that, in a fair world, then all then the average performance on all desirable and things would be equal for all groups. This is nonsense. Uh, in a way, I think people realize it's nonsense when they come up with notions of systemic racism or systemic sexism. It's kind of the idea of that is that's what you say when you realize you don't really have good evidence of actual intentional unfairness. Right. So while in some in a sense saying it's systemic racism makes it sound worse. But the whole idea of it is supposed to be it's not conscious. No one sits around thinking, I don't like that group. Rather, it's just the way the system works out. But then again, it comes down to, well, why do you think that it couldn't just be that some groups are better at some things than others for a long list of reasons? You know, if you see very few Jews succeeding in boxing, why would you think this is systemic religious bigotry rather than Jews aren't very good at boxing for which is possible for many reasons? Um, I then think that a key part of wokeism is trying to use fear and intimidation in order to get people to not ask these really obvious questions. So I think that's a lot else is what's going on. I mean, probably the, like the simplest way of thinking about wokeism is that it is a religious revival of a political philosophy that's been around pretty well for about 50 years. But like with other religious revivals, it's a time when people go back to the fundamental views of it and say like these are so obviously true the sinful world is failing to recognize them i'm really angry about it we need to go and rise up and do something about this so i mean i think of it as something like the rise of islamic islamic fundamentalism we've got a whole society where people kind of accept that this is the right philosophy but most people are fairly apathetic and disinterested and don't want to really make a lot of sacrifices for it and then some so-called radicals come along and say oh thou sinners well, you know, you know, like we know that you know, you know that we're right, but you don't have the the steel to go and actually live it. Hmm. Um, um, you know, my general view of all these movements is, that in a sense, that they while they claim to be radical, they're actually very conservative, and they really don't ask the question of, yeah, maybe your whole society is just totally wrong from the beginning, right? So, you know, like, you don't become a successful rad rad radical Islamist in the in the Muslim world by saying, yeah, maybe Quran's made up. Right. And similarly, don't become a radical politician or a radical political activist in the U.S. by saying, yeah, maybe all a sit blaming the problems of the world on racism and sexism was wrong from the get go, which would really be a much more radical thing to say, but super mm -hmm. unpopular. Instead, normally radicals just accept whatever is the conventional wisdom of society and then demand a literal interpretation, you know, which is a lot of what fundamentalism, fundamentalism is about. So whereas... 15 years ago, I think even then the normal view would be, yes, in a fair society, all races would have equal incomes, but it's like, yeah, okay, well, that's just, it doesn't happen. Oh, well, let's just live our lives. And then more recently, it's like, this is totally intolerable. We know why there isn't, there's inequality. It is because of this horrible unfairness of a wicked society. And it's somewhere to say, well, is it? Are there not other explanations? Right. And 
Yeah. And I think there's been, at least for, you know, when I was in high school, it was, it was um, say 20 or even 25 years ago, that recently there was this, uh, you, you mentioned left and right, uh, which, you know, you, you have a mm -hmm. book on, uh, you know, somebody might say, Brian Kaplan, he's, he, he must be far right. And then you have a book on open, you know, open borders. Mm -hmm. And there's this, you know, I, and I, I agree with a lot of your analysis on these topics. But what I found was when I was in high school, you know, it was always the left, uh, at least the way I saw it, uh, as the ones that are willing to have a conversation. And it was the right that, you know, more from a religious fervor would shut down conversations. Mm -hmm. And now I feel like it's the inverse. If you have mm -hmm. something that you disagree with on, for, and you're speaking with somebody on the far left, it's it's these are facts. There's there's no point debating them. Um, so that's that's the end of the, the conversation. Mm. So possibly you grew up in very different social circles than me. What I'll say is even in the 1980s, when religious belief was a lot stronger, pretty much no one outside of your family would ever go and hassle you about religion or preach it at you. Whereas wokeism is exactly like that. So, I mean, they are really like, like you know, they're more extreme than Jehovah's Witnesses <laughs> knocking on your door. They're, they're known for their extremism. Yes. Yeah. So like, I mean, I honestly, I don't remember any time when it was normal for right-wing people to go and just hassle others. Um, you know, you know, like, you know, so my friend Richard Nendia, he has a whole story about this, which is just the left cares more about politics and has for a really long time. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, maybe, again, that doesn't mean that it's always true, but definitely in my experience, uh, this does totally fit where the left-wing people, they just care more. Hmm. Right? Which, you know, they may say this is our virtue that we care more. It's like, well, maybe it's a virtue if you've got the answers figured out correctly, and then you combine that with motivation to go and fix problems. On the other hand, if you spend only a few minutes thinking about whether or not you're right, and then the rest of the time trying to win, well, that's a, a very poor way to allocate your energy. You really should do a lot more checking of your own starting point before you start trying to go and change things. So maybe you're just making things worse. All right, Brian, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, for listeners, if you could uh, let them know, and we'll put these in the show notes where they can, uh, you know, reach out to you or find any of the, uh, you know, any of the books you're talking about, where, uh, where can we send them? Yeah, so all of my books are available on Amazon. So that includes uh, you know, the major books that you're talking about. I also, in the last two years, have come up with four new books of collected essays. Uh, those are real cheap. So there's just 12 bucks for the paperback, 9.99 for the ebook. There's four more of those books of essays that are forthcoming in the pipeline. Then I've got two more books coming out. Uh, and then also I have a sub stack at, uh, it's just a bet on it. Uh, so um, that's, uh, you know, basically I do stuff about five days a week on that as well. My guest today has been Brian Kaplan. Brian, thanks for being part of Working Capital. All right, my pleasure. Great talking to you.